my camera passes a certain individual out there, he could take off and run around me, around the camera, and appear over here and be in my picture twice. <laughs> If you have to work, probably the ideal job is one that allows you to do for work what you also like to do for fun, like taking pictures. And at least one Juno resident is able to incorporate two of his interests, photography and history, into his work. And he's been interested in both of them for a long time. For example, when he first came to Juno, he would rebuilt a Model A Ford and drove it here. More recently, he's built an old-style 24-foot steamboat that can still occasionally be seen chugging along Gastineau Channel. This fascination with historical apparatus has provided leisure time activities for him, and it's also helped to shape a different kind of photographer. Ron Klein states emphatically that he is not a camera collector. He only has 50 or so. Most of them are old enough to be in a museum. He's rebuilt many of them to the point that they're beautiful enough to be on display, but unlike a collector, he actually puts his to work. And when he takes a portrait, he does it in a big way. Sometimes you get a really nice feeling about what you're doing. When I did the Juno town portrait for the first time, I mean, here was something. It, it, it seemed like I was giving the people out there something. And what he's giving them are pictures 10 inches high and 6 to 8 feet long or longer. He uses a panoramic camera that was built in 1902. They were extremely popular for a period of time, but went out of vogue around the 1930s. Only about 2,000 circuit cameras were built, and of these, only two or 300 are still left. The secret to taking extra-wide pictures is not having an extra-wide lens, it's having a camera that moves. When we turn the camera on, the film will wind over to a take-up drum. And as the film is moving this way, the camera will pan in the opposite direction, so everything is in sync. So when we turn the camera on, you see the film is now moving across to the take-up drum, and it's sweeping the scene. Okay, now, you see, we're only photographing a very narrow part of the picture out there right now. So as my camera passes a certain individual out there, he could take off and run around me, around the camera, and appear over here and be in my picture twice. <laughs> Sometimes three times. But what we do now, see, if you're in the picture twice, you got to buy two prints. It's only fair. Okay, the negative for these old cameras is not like your little 35 millimeter. It's great big. See, this is one negative. And what we're going to do is tape it to this contact frame. What I do is I start at one end, I just tape it right down and unroll this thing right down here. This is one picture. And we're going to tape it down, just masking tape right on there. Now I've got to kind of spread this thing out, you see. We'll have to put a piece up here and a piece down here. This is just on the very border that won't show, see. Now, after I get the negative taped down to the glass like this, I'm all set to print. It's all masked off. So we'll have to come around here to the other side. Okay. So once we've put the negative down onto the glass, then we can go over here to my paper safe and take the paper and bring it out across this pressure pad, see? 
We lay that all down there nice and good. Then we bring the negative over here in contact with the photographic paper and press really hard. Then I expose it with these light sources up here. The light is bouncing off of the ceiling down through the negative to the photographic paper. Now after the exposure, we raise the negative up and then I advance the paper. I have a foot switch down here that starts the motor in this box. It winds it into this magazine, see? So I can put another one in place and then I just continue. I expose number two, then number three, and we do an entire roll. And then when we get this roll done, we put it in my color processor. So after about nine minutes, we come down here to the end of the machine and the pr finished print is coming right out. It's so easy now. And color is easier than black and white. I don't touch any chemicals. I don't do anything. I just stand here and watch the prints come out. The novelty of these extraordinarily long photographs are enough to make most people take notice of them. But the real joy in looking at them is noticing their unusual clarity and detail. We're not enlarging the negative. The negative is the same size as the picture. You put a magnifying glass on there and just go right in and look at the finest detail and, you know, I've had times where I've seen a guy with a wristwatch on, you can tell what time it was. Ron has taken panoramic photographs in a number of places around the U.S. and in several foreign countries. His trip to China was at the invitation of a Chinese delegation visiting Alaska. I was real fortunate that uh, when I was in the country, they picked up the tab. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have been able to go. But, um, there's a reciprocal thing happening here now. And as a result of that trip, now there'll be Chinese photographers coming over to see me, and I will host them. I will pick up the tab. In Virginia, I photographed an old water wheel, a water wheel mill, and a pond with ducks in it. The photograph I took of McKinley is it's almost an accident, you know. I mean, I, I had to deliver something to Whittier. And a very good friend of mine who was also a panoramic photographer is in Fairbanks. And I wanted to see him. I said, hey, let's sort of kind of meet at McKinley, you know, see what's going on. So we did. We, we met there real early in the morning, and we drove into the park. We were just going to have a good time goofing around. And by the time we got back to the old Wonder Lake, it was sundown. And there was the mountain. So quick, hustle, hustle, set this thing up, took the picture. And we have made over a thousand copies of that thing. In spite of Ron's unique approach to picture taking, he's not that different in one way than most other photographers. He's never satisfied with what he's got. But in his case, instead of getting a bigger lens, he just gets a bigger camera. His latest is one of only two dozen or so still in existence. You know, with the 16-inch camera, film is $50 a shot. So I don't like to think about it that way. I buy film in a big pile, and I put it away, and then after I've not thought about the money for a while, I can go out and I can take pictures. And if I shoot one and, and something wasn't right, I'll shoot it again. And if that wasn't right, I'll shoot it again. I don't think about the $150 I just blew on film. You can't be that way. You have to, that's not a consideration. My ultimate dream, maybe, is someday I'm going to take the cameras. I want to go all around the world taking pictures. I want to go to the famous classic spots, the pyramids, the Great Wall. We, well, we already did the Great Wall. Go to the pyramids, go to the um, India, to Easter Island, take this classic shot that you, everybody knows what, what it looks like, but they don't know because they don't know what's behind the camera when the photographer was taking a picture. My camera, of course, would show what's behind the famous scene. And a lot of places I can only guess are not going to be very attractive. There's going to be the junk shop selling the tourist items, the bus drivers, the cab drivers, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're going to take that not because you think you can sell it and make some bucks. You're going to take it because you know, part of the, the goal here is, is to leave a mark on the world that makes the world a little bit better. It's just that the more you know about your past, the better off you're going to be. And this is one way of sending my little time capsule off into the future.